let me just press some buttons. Okay. So our speaker today is Cornelius Framp from the University of Vienna, who will be speaking to us about cosmological Russell Poisson equations for dark matter. Uh, feel free to take it away. Many thanks for the introduction and um, also thanks for the um, well invitation yeah, to speak um, again at Primary, at least virtually this time, yeah, but um, also very nice. <laughs> And um, so today I will talk, uh, by the way, uh, do you see this uh, little button here? That's a, it's a bit yeah. weird. Yeah, we okay, I think I can move it. It's a bit weird. There's some kind of bug, I think, from uh, from Zoom. You still see it? Yes. Yeah. There's oh, a no. little um, uh, green column thing here in the, in the corner. Yeah. No, we can see your mouse, but we can't see anything. You're okay, moving. perfect. Because I think there was still something uh, like a bug. Okay. Okay, back to the outline, yeah. So uh, today I will talk about um, the gravitational um, plus of Poisson equation. Was maybe a little too fast. Um, so I will, um, I will um, provide uh, a bit wider introduction also because um, it seems like there might be some um, uh, scientists uh, that are maybe not uh, exactly working in cosmology um, around. So, so there will be um, some introduction on this. So one of the, um, crucial problems uh, if it comes to the gravitational flux of Poisson equations is that, um, that dark matter has some very peculiar features. And uh, one of them is that uh, it is essentially collisionless and, um, and uh, it's, so it means that it can accumulate very efficiently locally and uh, therefore also lead to some ex very extreme densities. And um, in cosmology, we call it usually shell crossing this effect. Uh, I will come uh, uh, more in detail later of this. Um, I will also tell you um, um, some details um, um, what we actually learned in the past years. I mean, my colleagues uh, and collaborators um, about Flas of Poisson in seeing uh, what actually holds uh, it all together, the skeleton, so to say, of um, the cosmic large scale structure that um, if you uh, look on the very large scales is um, um, governed by the flux of Poisson equations. And um, I will also show you um, what, um, that it's not just like uh, a mathematical um, exercise to uh, detect all these kind of um, singularities in the in this theory, uh, much more crucial. I, honestly, I also learned this, um, um, I mean, not just like 10 years ago, but uh, a few years later maybe uh, that, um, uh, it's a very crucial exercise. If you know um, the singular structure of your underlying equations, you can actually use this, uh, exploit this knowledge and improve um, your theoretical uh, modeling um, tremendously. So I will come uh, back to this um, um, rather at the end of the talk, but uh, so I hope I can keep you um, entertained in the meantime. So, So the, um, according to the standard model of um, cosmology, everything started with a big bang. And the big bang left us with essentially four constituents. That is the, the atoms, radiation, cold dark matter, dark energy. And as the name already suggests or the wording, uh, we don't really know what dark matter is, what dark, dark energy is. We know at least um, to quite good knowledge already um, the, uh, some of the properties of these uh, constituents. But the precise nature, origin is still um, uh, up to debate. And of course, one, one crucial point of um, what uh, we're doing on, uh, in cosmology, well, at least one side of cosmology is asking exactly these kind of questions and see if we can learn something um, from the, um, the, largest, the, the largest observable length scales in the universe uh, about dark energy and dark matter. So some of the properties are um, um, fairly well known. So for dark energy, for example, we, we know pretty much that uh, it's uh, about 70% of today's energy budget. And one of the main effects of dark energy is that um, it drives, uh, well, it affects the expansion of space. And um, dark matter, um, which is um, um, basically um, six times more than the visible matter. So it's um, about 25% of today's energy content. So it's um, 
uh, something mysterious um, matter that um, seems to be extremely weakly in, uh, interacting with each other or also with other particles, well, except through gravitational interactions. So we can deduct it um, fairly straightforwardly that uh, there must be quite a lot of dark matter in the universe. But um, yeah, it's more like indirect um, uh, evidence for that usually. Um, and our very uh, important feature is that um, dark matter appears to be uh, um, collisionless and initially cold. I will come to this um, in more detail also uh, in the few slides. Cold means that it essentially has initially um, uh, no thermal velocity component. And um, to just give you like a quick um, recap um, or like an introduction to the Big Bang model, what happens is that after Big Bang comes first the big plasma. So it's a very hot state of the universe that is made uh, of ionized baryons, dark matter, electrons and radiation. And you can also see here the main chain of, um, of uh, reactions or uh, interactions between them. So the very crucial point is that at these early times, which is around 400,000 years after the Big Bang, that uh, the, the photons are coupled, well, indirectly through uh, the, um, to the baryons, um, well, through Thomson scattering and electrons, so to say. But uh, crucially, they have a pressure of photons and that acts as a counter force to gravity. And this is a very nice um, a little um, um, uh, uh, schematic of that uh, scenario. Basically, uh, gravity would uh, tell us that everything that has matter would um, start to collapse non-linearly non already at these early times. But thanks to the photon pressure, at least at these early times, there's a strong suppression of the formation of nonlinear structures. And that's well, we cosmologists can be also slightly thankful for that because that kind of explains why the linearized Einstein-Boltzmann equations um, describe the physics actually to very high precision at these early times. So the later evolution of the universe is uh, that, well, as the universe expands, uh, also the mean temperature of the universe drops. And because of that, some uh, interactions uh, start to freeze out. I mean, one of the first interactions that bec becomes basically uh, interactive is uh, Thomson scattering, which means uh, is that electrons can start to combine with baryons. And also that uh, basically that photons are um, finally allowed to escape from matter, thereby matter also loses uh, its pressure support well, from the photons, which means um, the, um, the, the, the birth basically of uh, nonlinear structures uh, begins uh, around 4,000 years after the Big Bang. So um, now comes the crucial point is that um, at least on the scales that we are interested in, which is um, very large scales, of course, that the evolution of dark matter is uh, now governed by the gravitational flux of Poisson equations. So I will not uh, uh, talk um, uh, too much uh, unless I'm forced to basically about this little bracket here. Uh, also because I'm pretty sure I talked about this um, uh, during my last uh, seminar at Queen Mary, although I, I admit it's, uh, it's quite some time ago. So anybody who has questions about this, um, I can of course uh, talk about this later in the discussion sections in more details. I, I find this actually very interesting, but there's just not, not enough time um, in the talk to talk about this in detail right now. So more crucial is that um, if you take the boundary conditions into account, you can actually swap uh, from general relativity uh, to um, a plus of Poisson, which of course is a Newtonian description, so to say. And I, I just show here the plus of Poisson equations basically in its full uh, um, condition, so to say. It, is, it looks a bit ugly at first sight, maybe if you haven't seen it before, but it, uh, it's, uh, it has a simple um, interpretation already at this stage. And the easiest uh, thing is that you can say that the dark matter distribution, it's of course the phase-based distribution is basically um, um, uh, described by these flux of Poisson equations, how the distribution of matter or dark matter is um, uh, changing in, um, in velocity and, um, and uh, location space. And it's all cu coupled um, to gravity only. So it's self interactions uh, through a Poisson equation. And um, yeah, so as, again, so this is basically the full system of plus of Poisson equations. But as we uh, see, 
this is actually um, not a very efficient way to work with um, floss of Porcel. Why is this? So consider here on the right side, the um, it's a simplified sketch um, of um, the phase space of dark matter. Here, basically, just assuming that the universe has only one space dimensions and one velocity dimension is, of course, not true, but um, it's just simplifying it. The crucial point is, because uh, dark matter, at least initially, was um, very cold, it, it means that um, its phase space distribution um, is confined on an infinitesimally thin sheet. So we call this sheet, which you can see um, here on the right-hand side, is um, the dark matter sheet. And um, we have actually um, quite good um, measurements and um, uh, balance uh, on the coldness of, um, of um, the coldness of dark matter. So for example, Dan uh, Thomas, um, 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 who is uh, working at Primary, as you know, uh, can talk about this, I think. And um, the idea is essentially that at these early uh, times, um, it's, uh, it's still uh, just like this very simple um, uh, um, in, um, structure of the phase space sheet. And as we will see, if you proceed now in time at later times, because of uh, gravitation interactions, the, the sheet will uh, basically start to, um, to, um, to um, uh, lead to local um, uh, huge variations. And we will come to this very shortly, what this means. Basically, um, if you have an overlap of uh, particles at, uh, at the same position as for example here, then you have um, usually also extreme densities um, uh, in company with that uh, kind of feature. But more to that later. So more crucial at this point is that this discussion or this, this kind of description here is kind of an overkill because at all times, uh, even at later times, um, through, through folding of the uh, dark matter sheet, the whole dark matter distribution is only confined on this sheet. So we, uh, we should look for a better parametrization of this sheet. And one of the nicest um, parametrization that you can imagine, or maybe I can imagine, I don't know, if it's just me, um, just kidding, uh, is basically looking um, uh, in this problem uh, from the point of Lagrangian um, um, perspective using Lagrangian coordinates. So for people who have not um, had contact with that, it actually is, um, I think, fairly straightforward. So basically Lagrangian coordinates um, I, I, I denote them here with a little, a little letter Q, are uh, basically just the initial positions of, uh, of your, of your uh, particles. So for example, here on the right-hand side, you see two of these particles at initial position. And these uh, white arrows are simply just the uh, trajectories, of course, in a simplified setup um, of these particles. And the idea is the following. So I, I drew here also on the, on the left-hand side, this little uh, image here with this uh, little river, right? And uh, the boat. So just a very simplistic idea of what uh, Olerian perspective and Lagrangian is, is if the Olerian observer would just basically stand here on the side and look uh, while this um, river is basically uh, floating uh, in this direction, for example. And uh, so it's not really following the fluid flow. Um, but if you think about the um, La Lagrangian observer, he's basically sitting on this boat. And of course, this is a very simple um, uh, picture here. You should think uh, about this, like uh, that there are observers sitting on all fluid particles uh, in this um, river. And then you pretty much have the perspective of what Lagrangian coordinates is. Mathematically speaking, it is basically just um, a, a parametrization of uh, all trajectories um, of your particles. So the, the great thing about um, this kind of parametrization is that the flux of Poisson equations simplify tremendously, okay? So what you get is essentially a Newtonian equation of motion that tells you that the acceleration of particles um, is proportional to the uh, gravitational field and that uh, field, of course, is exerted through a Poisson equation. So it looks um, actually much simpler already, at least um, um, uh, to my eyes, because you have basically uh, exploited the knowledge that your dark matter particles only sit on these um, uh, dark matter sheet. And this is um, a very um, constructive way to um, pursue the problem already. Yeah. So just a quick um, um, trying to connect to um, the plasma science field. There actually exists um, um, essentially um, a one-to-one -one correspondence, I would almost say, uh, uh, to plasma physics, which is the so-called one-component plasma. 
And you can see here um, that it essentially is uh, the same kind of law as in the, in the gravity case. But the crucial problem is, or the crucial difference, I should say, is that here you have a minus sign in, the, uh, in, the, um, uh, in this relation, whereas here you have a plus sign. So this is, of course, just um, a consequence of the attractive gravity, uh, character of, um, of the electronics. Uh, if they have like, a bunch of electrons, they, of course, uh, have a repulsive force. And that basically flips the sign in the interactions. But this is essentially the, I mean, at least on this very um, initial level, um, the, the only difference, so to say, between the gravity case and this uh, very simple one component plasma. Okay, back to the Cosmo case. So um, the equations still look, um, they look um, uh, much simpler um, as the initial equations. But uh, what you still have to solve is and this is the crucial point, how to actually calculate the density um, at, uh, at arbitrary late times. This is um, still non-trivial because what's happening schematically is that the dark matter particles, they can just um, uh, accumulate in the potential wells. And because they are collisionless, they have no pressure support. It means that they can accumulate very efficiently and this leads to extreme densities. And of course, one um, important uh, task of both theory and numerics is how to calculate um, the density um, at any time, at any location to um, sufficient um, precision. This is one of the most crucial aspects, I, I would say, in the flux of Poisson equation. So this is just a toy example to show you um, if you have essentially one solution, uh, say in Eulerian space or in Lagrangian space, you can, of course, reconstruct the full solution from either of them in principle. But as I also said, usually, at least for Kodak Metro, the most efficient parameterization is uh, by using these kind of uh, uh, Lagrangian coordinates. OK, so just quickly. Also, an overview of uh, what you can do on the numerical um, side of uh, flux techniques developed. And I'm, I'm really uh, be much more um, uh, techniques than I sketch here on this one slide. But um, as I said also on the other slide, um, uh, one crucial point of flux of Poisson is how to calculate efficiently and, uh, and um, precisely the, uh, the density field at any time. So, in a very short um, way, you can say that uh, these kind of simulation techniques, they essentially differ uh, in how you exactly calculate the density. So the simplest descriptions are possibly the most common one in cosmology. These are based on um, so-called n-body simulations. In plasma physics, uh, might call it particle and cell sim simulations, for example. So there is the idea that you core sample the phase space of cold dark matter by using, um, well, quite uh, large and discrete particles. And um, these uh, techniques um, have been um, in cosmology, I think since um, the 70s, the 80s, roughly. Yeah? And um, they also um, came uh, originally, many of these techniques came from plasma physics. So it's not that uh, cosmologists um, invented that uh, by scratch, from scratch. It usually has some uh, plasma background. And, um, one of the next refinement steps, uh, what you can do to a simple uh, embody technique um, is using um, embody simulations plus a phase-based simulation. And here the idea is basically, um, you can think about that you still have particles um, in your simulation, but before you calculate the density, you actually try to tes tessellate the phase space. And you use this knowledge to calculate the uh, density essentially in the continuum limit. And the continuum limit is um, derived from uh, these kind of core sample particles. It's a little uh, fine detail, so to say, but it gives you a really much better approximation of uh, what happens with the density. And then there are also um, more advanced um, um, or more sophisticated, um, if I may say, uh, techniques that basically are uh, using a full um, uh, tessellation in, um, in, 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 in the phase space. This is... Um, this is um, a very interesting uh, approach by uh, Suspi and Colombi. And um, it's, um, of course, the complexity goes up um, uh, uh, as you go down in this list. Yeah? 
And then finally, there's also like full plus of force uh, simulations that are not uh, constrained to the dark matter sheet. Um, but uh, such investigations you usually uh, do um, uh, if, you, if you want to evolve something else than just dark matter. So for example, uh, if you are interested in uh, neutrinos, which are um, lukewarm, you can say. Um, Okay, just really checking how I'm do with time. Okay, good. So one of the crucial points uh, in making progress in class of POSOR is actually already the first um, major hurdle is the uh, instance of shell crossing. Here uh, happens at uh, uh, time T1. So what I'm showing here is uh, the phase space uh, at initial time, so to say, and then here at shell crossing time and here after shell crossing. The first observation, if you just look on this here, you see that um, uh, at initial time, uh, at each position, you have uh, just a single valued velocity, uh, which uh, still holds actually until this point, which uh, will be related to shell crossing as we see uh, shortly. Uh, just um, um, uh, a teeny second later, so to say, after shell crossing, you have here a pronounced region with uh, multiple streams. So if you may say, um, you have um, here a region with, um, with just a velocity and here a velocity, but here you have some kind of uh, velocity dispersion. Here a, dis a dispersion that basically comes from an averaging process of uh, three um, metal streams. So this is quite crucial um, to understand this kind of um, 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 basic topology of uh, what happens in the phase space. And of course, you can also uh, draw the same uh, figure um, in, um, in so to say in Lagrangian uh, space, where you basically just draw the initial position of your particles over the current position. And uh, initially they are just aligned on a straight line, which means you start with an initial uh, homogeneous uh, density state. So you start with something that has um, uh, really just no density contrast. It's completely um, uh, has no grains, so to say in the density. But of course you give them some velocity kick initial time. This is uh, one of these boundary conditions that we are usually exploiting here. And then if you just uh, switch on the time, um, star crossing happens especially uh, exactly when, um, when uh, in this figure, when uh, the, the space derivative of this red curve uh, is, uh, is vanishing. So why is this the case? Why is this so critical in phase space? Um, if uh, the derivative or more um, exactly the determinant of, um, of this um, tensor, um, why is this so important in, uh, um, in, in, um, in fluid dynamics? just quickly to see why this is important. So if you just start with an initial state, you start just with some kind of um, dilution factor initially, and you just say that the, the mass uh, density is conserved. So you start with um, this kind of statement here. And then you also know that uh, these um, objects here, uh, these uh, volume elements that are basically related uh, through the Jacobian here. Oops. And then what you get is essentially um, a relation from these two that tells you that rho over um, rho bar is uh, equal to one over the Jacobian. So you see when the density goes to infinite, the Jacobian goes to, goes to zero and vice versa, okay? So basically you, um, you, um, you, you observe something in, in phase space that the density that is essentially parameterized by the trajectories of your particles, that is now um, um, simply uh, given in terms of the Jacobian. Yeah? It's a very simple uh, feature. Okay, so there are a, a few analytical shell crossing solutions. So which I, at, um, at least um, um, in our field, we, uh, this is the, one of, this was one of the most important problems actually, I would say. Uh, since the, the early works of uh, Sildovich in the 60s and Dobikov. And um, the idea is essentially, let's first see if we understand uh, shell crossing uh, for uh, some kind of simplified initial conditions. Just because um, it's sometimes it's important to understand the, um, the mathematical structure before you really switch on all the details uh, that will later be uh, present um, in, of course, in the real universe. And some of the most easiest um, um, models is um, essentially, well, something from Jim Peebles, Nobel Prize winner from uh, a few years back, worked on the swell collapse model. 
but then also I think uh, possibly even, uh, more relevant uh, for uh, for Plus of Poisson are the solutions by Silovich and Dobikov. And uh, then uh, the kind of uh, first uh, uh, step um, to actually um, go uh, to also uh, to some kind of initial conditions that are not just like um, one dimensional, but something which is um, which is already more of practical relevance, so to say, to the 3D case. And um, so just quickly to, to see uh, what, what that means, uh, this kind of quasi 1D and 1D collapse, uh, because um, I mean, we know we live in a 3D universe, spatial universe. So what is first of all uh, a one dimensional um, um, collapse scenario in, in 3D? You can think about like initial gravitational potential that is just like a cosine, so to say. And um, if it's perfectly um, um, uh, one dimensional, the problem, it's essentially you abet um, a 1D problem in 3D. What you get is essentially our uh, mass sheets that are uh, just basically moving left or right, and they have no further grains in the other corner directions. And now the, the first kind of um, uh, departure from the from one dimensions is uh, so-called quasi uh, one dimensional. Uh, as you can see here, it's, it pretty much still looks like the 1D case, uh, but now you're adding a little information also in the other corner direction. And of course, this is just some uh, example. And um, basically in a, in a paper with uh, Ugel Frisch, uh, we, we, uh, we basically found that we can calculate uh, for this kind of um, first non-trivial 3D um, uh, example, the flux of possible equation exactly until the share crossing. Yeah? So it um, was um, um, even for us a surprise that it works. Uh, because it's um, it's it's already quite um, a big um, jump from 1D to 3D. But then um, uh, further things happened in the, in the in, uh, more or less recently is that we can actually now also calculate these things for our realistic uh, initial conditions. But I'll come to this uh, shortly. Yeah. First, I want to give you quickly uh, an idea what um, actually the um, um, the strategy is to to obtain these uh, uh, solutions. And um, the crucial point is. Uh, exactly the, the first two steps. The first step is that you switch to Lagrangian coordinates, which uh, essentially desingularizes the problem. This sounds a bit mathematical, but it's actually quite simple. Try to resolve an infinity in a simulation. It's, uh, it's really difficult. So it's much easier to actually um, um, look for something that is close to vanishing. And the same is true, also, especially for theory, for, for people who know about perturbation theory. If you want to resolve something that is going to zero, it is much easier um, uh, than uh, resolving something that goes to infinity. It's the first uh, crucial step. The next one that basically goes uh, back to this uh, seminal paper by Seligowski and Frisch, um, they basically showed that uh, the, um, the underlying equations are uh, analytic in a time variable. Analytic means that you can represent these um, um, the trajectories um, of your of your of your particles of your dark matter particles in terms of a convergent Taylor series. This is essentially a crucial thing uh, before doing any kind of serious uh, calculation in um, um, uh, around plus of fossil. So this is a very important uh, approach um, paper there. And then um, comes a bit of the tedious uh, job um, that you, you should also see how long your Taylor series actually provides uh, some uh, good um, representation of your field. And for this, you need, um, sometimes you can uh, calculate this by analytical means and uh, occasionally you need to do some um, uh, numerical tests to calculate the, um, the basic the limits of your Taylor series, the rates of conversions. Okay, I will just quickly uh, uh, skip through this because this is maybe a little bit too technical and um, maybe important for, for, for many of you. But uh, if anybody has questions to that, I can of course talk about this more in detail. One of the crucial points is that um, you introduce usually a displacement field uh, in cosmology and you can essentially write this kind of uh, equation of motion uh, in terms of a divergence equation for this displacement and um, a, a curl uh, equation for displacement. And this T um, is just a temporal operator. So to say, once you calculated um, the, this uh, operator on this, you, um, this um, um, uh, which also has some kind of source terms on the right-hand side here, you can calculate the displacement uh, with a Helmholtz uh, problem. So just very quickly, uh, it has actually very simple um, physical interpretation, these uh, two terms, although I don't want to write it down. Basically, uh, M, the term is exactly zero if there's no multi-streaming. So it's uh, basically something that uh, only um, switches on once uh, shared crossing occurs. 
The other term here um, is this W and this A, these other source terms, they are um, only non-zero if um, your problem has at least um, a, um, a call independence that goes beyond one dimensions. That's quite a no, quite nice feature huh? because then you can already calculate uh, the very easy the linear solution and you'll find that the solution actually um, gives you uh, like a Sadovich solution, which essentially is just saying something about uh, ballistic motion. So you just uh, prescribe essentially a velocity kick of your particles and, um, and this gives you the Sadovich solution here. Yeah. And here you can already see that actually the solution is exact if your problem is only uh, dependent on one dimension. So if you have a universe that only depends on one space dimension, so the solution is exact simply because all these source terms are exactly zero in that case. Um, now comes the bit more like the um, um, uh, completion, so to say. Um, you have calculated the linear solution. Now you need to switch on these uh, kind of source terms here and you start calculating these uh, equations by um, using um, um, a Taylor series uh, ansatz for the displacement. And for this, we also have recursion relations so we can calculate this uh, these days very simply, very easily. Okay, just quickly, um, what um, one uh, can so uh, one can in principle also do like an expansion or layering coordinates. Then you get these kind of um, uh, fluid equations that are um, uh, you can of course also solve uh, with uh, some kind of Taylor series ansatz. This is um, normally called uh, like standard perturbation theory. And also here we have um, a simple all all our recursion relations for them for actually quite some time already. But what you see is, I'm, I'm showing here just like the density um, at basically the half time um, before shell crossing occurs. So the density is here just peaking at uh, the value of two. This is still quite um, low, uh, I would say. And you see that um, if you go basically in this kind of uh, representation up to the 10th order, this, you get the green line. It essentially, um, it's just uh, agreeing with the exact solution. But I, I had to basically calculate things up to the tenth order, while um, in, in uh, Lagrangian coordinates, the which would be exact solution. So you can already see that actually is um, um, a much uh, faster converging uh, solution if you're in Lagrangian coordinates. And one reason why um, um, uh, it converges so badly in Eulerian coordinates is that you have essentially in your uh, fl uh, fluid equation, uh, um, it's telling you something about convective motion. You have this kind of term here. Um, you have also convective term that comes from here and here, so to say. And these terms are um, quite uh, um, tricky to calculate in uh, Eulerian um, coordinates. Whereas if you're on Lagrangian coordinates, because you co move with the fluid particles, you essentially take care of these. And this is essentially why um, for dark matter particles, um, Lagrangian coordinates are superior to Eulerian uh, approaches because they um, take care of the convective motion straight away with, uh, with no further uh, input. So um, in a very interesting paper by uh, Sagat Ria Colombi um, in 2018, there have been um, the first kind of verifications of these shell crossing solutions. And um, I will not go too much into the details, but what you can see is that um, the, um, um, the, there are two uh, scenarios, maybe we should not draw here. Um, one is basically what I described before, uh, a quasi 1D collapse. So something that is uh, fairly close to a one dimensional collapse, but not exactly, yeah. And something that um, is um, what we call triaxial. It's just, um, you have some kind of sine wave amplitudes that have slightly different amplitudes in the coordinate directions. And what you can see quite uh, easily, I think by eye already here is, that uh, for quasi 1D, you have essentially uh, an overlap between uh, LPT, which is essentially the solutions uh, scheme I showed you earlier, and the simulation technique. Whereas uh, if you go um, to the triaxial collapse case, you see that the red uh, dashed line, well, it's, it still looks like it's converging, but uh, the speed of conversions is uh, much slower. So in a, in a nutshell, the speed of conversions of your um, uh, theoretical solutions depends um, on the topology of your initial seeds. So if something is close to one dimensions, then uh, essentially it converges very fast. If it's um, not a one dimensional collapse, but something more um, ellipsoidal, for example, you still have conversions, but it's, uh, it's a bit slower. So you need to include more Taylor um, coefficients. Okay, so there have been, um, um, I, I've worked with this also with uh, Oliver Hahn, uh, now on uh, a realistic 3D initial conditions. 
So there, because you, know, you essentially have uh, some kind of Gaussian field uh, as the in in input field, you need to do calculations on a, on a mesh because you need to calculate um, all these kind of um, FFTs, Fourier transforms that are involved in this kind of calculation here um, um, uh, easily on the mesh. Yeah. So this uh, can be done uh, quite efficiently um, in, uh, in a code setup. And we have actually calculated uh, for CDM um, these kind of coefficients up to the 15th order, which is um, much higher than you usually would go uh, for any kind of applications, I would say. But we actually wanted to make sure that we have a convergent uh, scheme. So this is why we actually uh, looked uh, quite in detail in this scenario. So one thing what you can look at is this kind of um, uh, PDF that basically um, uh, moves all particles uh, until the one of the particles at one grid location is shell crossing, but then calculate basically this kind of uh, perturbative uh, residual um, that basically just tells you how large are truncation errors at the time when the first of all these particles is, um, is shell crossing. And as you can see, uh, the higher you go in the orders, the more it goes into a, like a delta peak. So it's kind of a Hulling effect. So basically this tells you that you have um, conversions uh, essentially um, everywhere in, in your whole universe um, in our box, I would, should say, yeah, uh, on all grid points. In more detail, one can also calculate essentially what kind of, um, uh, what is the rate of convergence um, of, uh, of the displacement series. And for this, uh, one should maybe recall this kind of uh, ratio test that um, uh, uh, I think it was back to D'Alembert and Cauchy, um, famous mathematicians, that basically tells you if you take the, the coefficients um, and um, subsequent coefficients and do take the limit n to infinity, you can calculate the rate of convergence of these of the series. And uh, we have done this for several kind of cosmologies and also different resolutions. And the idea is essentially um, if you uh, just, uh, this, is, this is called the DOM6, uh, DOM Sykes plot. And you basically um, um, uh, extrapolate uh, this kind of uh, limit here by just plotting it over one over n. So essentially you take all these ratios and um, the higher you go in the ratios, the more you go on the left. And then at some point it settles usually or often into a linear behaviors. And then you can do um, an extrapolation to the um, zero um, point here, which precisely gives you the limit uh, n to infinity. Yeah? So it's a very clever trick by um, Dom Sykes. And that works very nicely also here in our case. Okay, what time if? Okay, I should maybe speed up a bit. Yeah? I have still a few slides. So just quickly, um, what you can do also beyond shell crossing. So one important thing is the of poisson equations are still, um, have this very simple structure here, but now the, the Poisson equation gets essentially uh, a modification because now the density um, is uh, the consequence of, um, of uh, calculating um, the density from different streams. So what I mean with that is the following. So if you show here the current position of your, your particles and your, um, your initial positions, and after shell crossing, what you will have is something like this. So you have um, a regime which is a uh, multi-streaming, right? This box here is multi-streaming. And now you want to calculate, for example, the density at X zero, then you basically uh, need to calculate the density at these three uh, intersections. Basically, it tells you at the current uh, position, you need to calculate the densities that comes from three uh, separate um, metal streams. But this is essentially the only simplification that happens after shell crossing, or not simplification, the, the, the complication yeah, uh, that happens uh, at shell crossing or after, but otherwise the equations are still unchanged. So the idea is now to um, um, calculate um, um, this in a, in a kind of um, a bootstrapping uh, process, so to say. So first you calculate the trajectories until shell crossing, basically until the first time you, uh, you see some shell crossing happening. And then you start with a fresh start and provide boundary conditions at shell crossing and you calculate these kind of equation of motion now with a refined uh, strategy that basically tells you that the force that um, is um, you calculate at shell crossing uh, uh, time is essentially given by the solution that you have joined, obtained beforehand. So it's um, it's kind of iterative procedure where you bootstrap like the 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 the, the, the actual trajectory that that we call x to like um, like a, a solution that you obtained before. 
any of, co of case, you can uh, continue this bootstrapping to higher and higher orders. And uh, this kind of um, um, strategy works, um, it seems uh, actually extremely well. So I show you here um, results that are completely independent uh, from each other. One is basically showing the, the phase space um, of, um, of uh, particles after shell crossing. The dots are the simulation results and, um, and the solid lines is the theory. There are, we actually don't need any um, kind of um, numerics. This is actually in one dimensions where we can calculate this completely by uh, elementary means. And uh, what you can see is there's essentially um, uh, agreement uh, at least at these uh, very short times after share crossing. And uh, what you also see is the following. You see that uh, if you take essentially the second derivative, time derivative of your, um, of your particle trajectories, you get the acceleration. And the acceleration is um, uh, in this multi-streaming region. This is the same time um, uh, as, uh, as shown here. It shows some kind of uh, non-differential features. So these kind of um, kinks here, 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 and here, these are actually um, uh, non-differentiable. It means that um, uh, if you would take another uh, derivative uh, on your uh, trajectories, so a third time derivative, you would see some singular behavior here. So in mathematics, you would call this a singularity, something that uh, occurs maybe not directly in your face, not at the leading order, but uh, when you start uh, taking derivatives and something goes infinite, this is what we call a mathematical singularity. And uh, there's also another singularity that basically is non-trivial. It, uh, it basically results if, if you start with something that is slightly asymmetric at initial time. You see here, initial time, um, these kind of um, flanks are not the same uh, height, so to say. But uh, with these initial conditions, you can uh, and, and just fix here uh, one particle, uh, kind of a spectator particle, you, you may say. This um, particle stays um, at the origin until shell crossing, but then after that, st st suddenly uh, starts moving. Something which is highly non-trivial to calculate in, in practice, but we actually um, uh, finally got a handle how to do that. <laughs> and um, yeah, and uh, it agrees also uh, um, not, not too bad uh, with uh, simulations. Um, so it's something that, um, um, yeah, you basically need to exploit um, um, the uh, invariance of the underlying equations under non-Gallian transformations. So uh, that was um, quite uh, intense. So you might, might think, okay, why um, bother all uh, doing uh, these kind of calculations uh, if it's so intense, if it's really worth it? And um, simple answer, yes, definitely. Yeah. And um, I give you one example why this is so crucial to understand uh, where exactly uh, things go to infinite and where not. And one simple uh, example, is uh, if you look at the spherical collapse model, this is one of the uh, last few slides, by the way, um, that you basically have an exact parametric solution provided by Jim Peebles. But you can, of course, also describe it with, um, with perturbation theory. And so to say, this is one of the, the worst case examples for perturbation theory because it converges, but very poorly. So what you see here are these kind of trajectories for the over density case. This is the first order result, and you see then the fifth order result and the 10th order result, and the exact solution is just given here. Uh, it actually converges. Uh, I have verified this actually at, uh, some time ago, but you have to go to uh, ridiculously high orders in, uh, in perturbation theory, completely impractical. And even more obscure is if you just now don't look at uh, an over density, but over of an under density. So basically, uh, instead of a potential uh, trough, you look at a potential height, so to say, and uh, still the same recursion relations apply. And what you observe is that uh, a certain loss of convergence that precisely happens because of an accident, a mathematical accident, so to say, because the series um, also in this case only converges um, at this uh, dot dashed line here. And basically once this um, uh, convergence uh, is, is um, time is, for, is, uh, is, uh, is over, you, are having, uh, you have lost your convergence. And now comes this kind of um, um, ultraviolet uh, completion that uh, basically exploits asymptotic behavior of large N uh, Taylor coefficients. And the idea is the following, is that uh, if you know the, the nature of your singularities, you identified them, you can actually uh, use this kind of knowledge and um, 
basically complete uh, the series without going really up to infinity because you can, uh, there are certain ways how to do that. And um, I'm, I'm showing here essentially just uh, at third order, the UV completion essentially gives an exact uh, overlap with the parametric solution. And even more striking is actually the void case where you have essentially like an overlap um, between um, the parametric solution and the, um, and the uh, perturbation theory um, uh, description. Again, this is one of the most um, challenging uh, problem for perturbation theory, this kind of spherical uh, uh, collapse. So this is, um, this is, I'm showing here the worst case scenario basically of what can happen in the universe. Okay, just quickly, but I, I should maybe um, re-speed up because I think I'm slightly over time ready or I think I'm exactly a finished uh, principle. I want to give you also um, some indications uh, of how all this relates uh, in more detail to uh, the plasma case. But um, I, will, um, I will try to uh, go uh, quickly through it because um, uh, for people who are interested, they can also just um, ask questions uh, on this. So the, the one component plasma, and I'm showing here also in comparison, the uh, plus of Poisson equation in the gravity case, you see now um, one of the crucial differences between these description is, well, in the, in, the, in, the, in the gravity case, you have your Hubble drag term, essentially because you're in a corner system that, um, that um, is, um, takes into account the uh, co-moving expansion of the overall universe. But uh, otherwise, uh, you basically have a, a very similar um, structure of your uh, equation of motions in comparison to the one component plasma. Uh, very interesting um, uh, or classical problem in plasma physics is also the so-called beam plasma instability. There are certain um, um, uh, subversions of that, so I, I will not go much into detail. But basically what you have is um, uh, something what we could in cosmology would call a two fluid problem. So you have uh, essentially electrons that uh, move in a, in a background plasma. And what you have now is uh, a Poisson equation or a class of Poisson equation for each component um, of your species. And they are coupled through gravity uh, to each other, okay? But if you compare this with uh, above, it's still a very similar structure. And as it turns out, this kind of uh, structure here with two fluids, um, we have actually also worked on, uh, on this. Uh, it also applies um, to the gravity case. If you look, uh, for example, at large scales um, on the co-evolution of dark matter and baryons, then you also have um, a very similar structure of plus of Poisson equations. And very lastly, uh, because plasma physicists uh, usually uh, have um, um, a huge interest in, um, in warm or hot um, uh, plasmas um, is um, that um, it's a very uh, uh, interesting idea that um, has been exploited already um, uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. That is, if you want to investigate something that is warm, so it has something that has a thermal um, uh, distribution in phase space, it means that you have not just a single value velocity, but you have like um, a pronounced um, um, uh, thermal component uh, of your velocity. You can essentially um, seek for solutions uh, by just layering um, um, these kind of uh, single beam solutions. So you're stacking uh, your, your configuration up with, um, with a collection of cold beams and that are basically as a model, as a first approximation, so to say, if you want, uh, as warm features in the phase space. And um, also this has actually quite interestingly um, um, a corresponding um, um, problem in cosmology that uh, has been um, uh, a few years um, uh, intensely investigated by, um, uh, by these uh, two groups here. And that basically is, uh, if you want, want to model the warm features of uh, neutrinos, uh, you can think about that the phase space of neutrinos because they have some temperature, they have still some kind of thermal character. You want to um, basically um, evolve this. And uh, for this one can actually um, um, apply um, fairly uh, similar techniques as, um, as explained here. Yeah. Okay, I'm concluding. So we have, um, um, I hope I convinced you that we have now um, gained a much better understanding of um, uh, what is actually the skeleton of, uh, of the gravitational class of Poisson equations. And um, I hope I also uh, could convince you that um, it's not just like um, a mathematical exercise, but actually it has uh, straightforward applications. And I'm just listing here a few examples. Um, what uh, has been already done actually and something that uh, will uh, probably happen in the next uh, um, one or two years, uh, quite in the short term, is uh, essentially um, exploiting 
um, theoretical approaches that are um, uh, much better than uh, Lagrangian uh, federation theory, which is so to say the gold standard um, of uh, in cosmology. So something that uh, we, by just knowing, uh, exploiting the knowledge of uh, what happens at share crossing or after share crossing, um, that this can actually help in uh, improving uh, tremendously the um, accuracy of your modeling. Okay, some some future directions is uh, basically also very interesting field is um, um, to pair um, uh, predictions from theory with uh, simulations. There actually have been also um, already a couple of uh, papers in the last two or three years. I just forgot to uh, give the references, uh, but I can give you them if you like. That's very interesting, I find, because essentially it's a hybrid approach where you, you, know, you use both the theoretical knowledge uh, as well as uh, the accuracy from the numerical simulations to uh, get a deeper understanding of your problem. And of course, this is more like a, a long-term statement, of course, um, that cosmology, uh, especially the numerical part, has uh, um, hugely benefited from um, a lot of input from plasma physics. And um, I think it's very important also in the future to um, try to um, keep um, this kind of level of, um, of uh, transfer of knowledge from different fields of physics or even in mathematics. So um, I hope this will uh, continue um, also in, in all directions, hopefully. And lastly, I want to also just uh, make advertisement for this um, uh, paper uh, that where you can uh, essentially read a lot of details that I just presented today. It's uh, open access, so you can also just uh, read there uh, freely um, uh, at will um, more details about what I showed you today. Can I stop now? Thank you. Hi. Right. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. Um, before we move on to questions, I just need to end the stream. Um, right. And if there is anyone online who 